Hi everybody, I'm Al Southerd, and we're glad you've joined us again for another edition of Inside Broward Sports. Our color commentator, Ed Waters, the head coach at St. Thomas High School, should be along shortly. He had a game scheduled this afternoon, and uh, probably with our luck, they are in extra innings, but we anticipate his arrival shortly. Two clubs right now playing about 500 ball. In fact, it's exactly 500 as the you take a look at the District 13-4A standings. Plantation in seventh place. They are 8-7 and seven in the district, 10-10 ten ten overall. Wow, Western right behind them. They are 7-7-1 seven, seven and one in district play, 9-9-1 nine, nine and one over the course of the season. A couple of teams very similar in many ways, uh, both operating under first-year head coaches. We have Bart Graff from Plantation, who comes in after being an assistant and working with the junior varsity over the last four years. And then over in the Western dugout, Ken Smith who was an assistant last year with the Wildcats and then took over the head job this year. Both working with some very young talent. You'll see a lot of uh, juniors, even a few sophomores spread out through the operation today, through the lineups of both of these teams. And one of the big problems they have had, both at the bat and in the field, has been some lapses because of inexperience and lack of varsity level competition. So they are looking for this to be a building year upon which they can take a springboard of sorts into the 1991 season. The starting lineup for Western as you look on, Chad Lakowski will be leading off playing third base followed by Mike Hudson, Bob Kristoff in the three spot with the catcher Tom Bottleson batting fourth, Billy Goodman, James De Silva, Frank Stokes, Jim Icavoni, and Matt Wilson round out the Western lineup. And we're very glad to have joining us with us now is uh, Ed Waters. And Ed, uh, let me guess, you went into extra innings this afternoon. No, uh, <laughs> it's only seven, but it's a long one. Long game. Well, we're glad you've joined us. And uh, an interesting game. At least it should be a very competitive game between these two clubs. Part of their problem, I, as we mentioned before you got here, is uh, some inconsistency with a lot of uh, young kids on both sides as we take a look at the mound for Plantation, where George Mianowski, a transfer from Canada, will be pitching. Number six, George is one and two with a 2.55 earned run average. And I don't know if you've had a chance to see him in, but they say he's uh, got a very good fastball for a high school level play. Uh, a lot of the players on our team is, have talked about him and said that he throws the ball well. I haven't seen him before, but I heard he throws the ball pretty good. Coach Barncraft says that uh, he's been clocked uh, at one time in the upper 80s and usually throws the fastball in there in the mid 80s. He's got big legs. If you look at his legs, he's got a, a lot of times guys that throw hard have strong legs because they have a good push off. Nolan Ryan has tremendous legs. They say that's what makes him throw so hard. <clears throat> so Chad Lakowski will start things off this afternoon. The junior hitting 260 with no homers and five RBIs and he takes one in tight for ball one. And ball two is the count. The umpires tonight behind the plate, Don Fowler, and on the base pass, Harry Ozias. There you get a look at Don Fowler. And the 2-0 pitch hit down towards third base where it goes off the glove of Todd Gumowitz, the third baseman. And that'll go down as a base hit. Yeah, I think that was the hit. So Lakowski is on to start the game off with a base hit down the line. Let's check. The plantation defense, behind the plate, it's Paul Reardon. First base has Sean Fisher, Kevin Guillot at second base, Gumowitz at third, and Jason Donahue at shortstop. In the outfield, it's Brad Sheets in left, Claude Love in center field, and Aaron Voracek in right. This is Mike Hudson, the right fielder. Mike hitting an even 250. This is just his 13th at bat of the season. And he's looking to bunt. And the ball gets away. And I think it was just tipped off the end of the bat, Ed. And they're going for the bunt in the first inning, so they're not going for the big inning. They're playing for one run. Both of these clubs have had their problems at the plate. 
Plantation hitting about 224 as a team and Western hitting 210. The one strike pitch, once again showing bunt is Hudson. Reardon quickly out from behind the plate, keeping Lakoski close at first. For Mianowski, he is the number one pitcher on the plantation staff. He just became eligible to play March 1st because he did transfer down here and had to wait a certain period of time. Nope. Fouled up and out of play. And the count goes to one and two. Mianowski beat Taravella, which was a big win earlier this season for Plantation. It was a three to one game. Mianowski holding the Spartans to just three hits and 10 strikeouts. And that's quite an accomplishment, Ed, as they are one of the finer ball clubs in the county. Yeah, that was our uh, loss this year was to Taravella and they, <clears throat> they were good contact hitters. So that was a good performance to strike out 10 of their hitters. Throw back to first, but Lakoski hey, back in there. Two. Come on, let's go. One and two to Mike Hudson. Breaking ball just misses outside. And the count even at two and two. This might be a good time to send a runner. Mianowski's losses came to Miramar, a 3-2 loss, held him to just four hits. He takes another throw back to first base. And he also lost to Cooper City. So this is just his fourth appearance of the season for the Colonels. Mianowski also has a knuckleball, but uh, rarely if ever uses it with runners on base. Still not quite certain about which direction it's gonna go. Ball getting away from the first baseman Fisher, but not far enough to allow Lakowski to move up. Count still two and two on Hudson. Goes down swinging. Chasing a Mianowski fastball. So Mike Hudson recording the first out, and we take a look on the replay and the fastball just on the outside corner. Hudson couldn't reach it. With one out and one on, it's the center fielder, Bob Kristoff. And the senior is hitting 300. Two home runs, six RBIs, picked up a home run yesterday in a three to nothing win over Miramar. And Mianowski starts him off with the curveball for a strike. You got, you got him now. You got him, George. He said, what was that, George? What was that? That was right down the pipe. Kristoff also the number one pitcher on the Wildcat staff. And he picked up that win yesterday as well against Miramar. And you usually see that combination, Ed. Uh, your good athletes are uh, oftentimes uh, one of your better pitchers as well as your one, or one of the best hitters that you'll have on your team. True, you, you have to use your talents and you have to get those kids in the, in the lineup when they're not pitching at this level especially. <clears throat> Unfortunately, sometimes when they go to college they don't get that opportunity and some of them are still pretty good hitters, but they're recruited as pitchers and then that's all they do when they go to college. Mm -hmm. Two strikes, the count on Kristoff. Janoski's <coughs> still taking a look at Lakowski over at first base. I think one of the reasons that you don't see, uh, well, I'm sure you see good pitching, but not as much as usual, is some of the best athletes, because of the designated hitter rule, they don't want to be pitchers because they're afraid they're going to have to give up hitting when they get to that level. Runner going, the throw, not in time. In fact, it gets away into short left field, and Lakowski heading for third, hold it, hold it. and he'll reach it safely. That hurts. They had no one covering on that. There was a, that's a mental breakdown on their team right there. Nobody covering the bag. You got to look for that first hitter in the lineup to be running. So Kristoff strikes out for the second out. 
but on the throw and the ball getting away into left field, McCaskey ends up at third base with two away. And that'll leave it up to the number four man, Tom Bottleson, the catcher, hitting 256, two homers and nine RBIs. He has been in a recent slump lately. Coach Ken Smith said that just last week he dropped 120 points in his average. Yes. Looks at a fastball high. That sounds like a lot, but usually this time of the year, you really haven't had all that many at bats. Right. So if uh, you get into an 0 for uh, 15 or 20, that's, that's going to really, really just, down. That's why a couple of good days can bring it right back up. A couple of good days to get that average up there again. From the full windup, Minowski. Good spot, good spot. A little bit low, <clears throat> and he falls behind 2 and 0. Last summer, Bottleson had unusual surgery for a high school level player. We'll talk about that in a second. Good fastball. Bottleson takes a cut at it. But he had uh, surgery on his right arm to. Uh, the elbow area to have the uh, nerve replaced, something uh, like Tommy John, and I guess a lot of uh, other pitchers have gone through. Breaking ball down and away, Reardon moving out to cover up, and it's three and one. Is that something that uh, is very rare at the high school level, Ed? At that age, I would think it's a rare to, something to see something that young to have that problem. Maybe he started throwing curveballs too soon. Ooh. Fastball misses just outside. So Mianowski walks his first man. Bottleson heads up to first, and the Wildcats now have runners at the corners with two out. And the batter will be the second baseman, Billy Goldman. <coughs> Take a look at the plantation defense. Reardon steps out front to have a quick word with his pitcher. So me and Askew will have to go back to the stretch. Goldman hitting 177. No homers, seven RBIs. And he takes a fastball on the corner for strike one. This is always an interesting situation in high school, first and third, because you can pull a lot of plays in the high school level that you might not be able to get away with at the college and pro level. It's always interesting to see what the different teams do in first and third situations. Well, we saw the Wildcats trying to bunt with a second yeah. batter early on, yeah. indicating that the, they feel that a run or two is going to be very important. <clears throat> yeah, with a pitcher that looks as good as this kid, you might want to try to steal a run. And we'll see what they do with two strikes on Goldman if they decide to send everybody. Takes a fastball a little bit outside. Nice the pitch. Side corner. So Mianowski strikes out the side, gives up one hit, one error, walks one, leaves two on. And as we go to the bottom of the first, Western nothing, and Plantation coming to bat. That was a good pitch right there. Just about now, you're probably ready for a large dose of Bud Ruckers fun and to taste the world's great. Hey, take a look at Joey Ponton, who is the starting pitcher for the Wildcats. He comes in with a 3-2 and two record, a 2.80 earned run average. The left-hander has had some control problems. Average fastball. Coach Ken Smith says that it takes a while for him to get his curveball going, a couple innings at least. But he's had some good outings. He had 12 strikeouts versus Hallandale this year. And then in his last start against Dillard, racked up six strikeouts and just three innings pitched. 
Hey, you take a look at the plantation lineup tonight. It'll be Claude Love starting off playing left field. Brad Sheets in center field for Love. Sheets in left field. Paul Reardon behind the plate and Sean Fisher, the first baseman, batting cleanup. Aaron, Aaron Voracek, Todd Gumowitz, Jason Donahue, Matt Malinsky. They have had some changes, so it's going to be Fisher, Mianowski, Voracek, Matt Malinsky, Todd Gumowitz, and Jason Donahue will be the batting order. Defensively, Behind the plate, it's Tom Bottleson, Jim DeSilva over at first with Billy Goldman at second base, Chad Lakowski at third, and Jim Iacovoni at shortstop. Frank Stokes in left, Bob Kristoff in center, and Mike Hudson in right. Ponton ready for the first pitch to Claude Love, and he misses outside. Love. Played in his first varsity game just last night. He went one for four, had a double, drove in a run. And takes another fastball outside. Love just coming to Plantation this year, transferred from Los Angeles. Was hitting 700 on the JV team, so I guess that's a pretty good argument to move him up. I guess he had a good argument to come up to the varsity. Well, he's got the count 3-0 and now. He's a leadoff hitter. He can get on base and get something going. So on four straight pitches, Love heads on down to first base. And Western coach Ken Smith said that the first inning is the indicator on Ponton of whether he's going to last. Said if he starts having problems early on, he's not going to hesitate to pull him on out. Brand Sheets, the left fielder. He's a junior hitting 222. No homers, four RBIs. Worked his way on the, to the varsity midway through the 89 season. And now five straight balls as Ponton misses outside. And he pitches for them also, right? Sheets is also one of their pitchers. I right, Brand Sheets also uh, alternates between the number two and three starter for the Colonels. Ponton gets the strike right, in, Brad. one and one. And already, right, Ken Smith not hesitating to get some action up in the Wildcats bullpen. One and one the count, runner at first base. He and he's heading off, hit down to third base. Lakowski oh, goes to second play. for the force out. Beautiful play. Great defensive play by the Wildcats as they go around the horn. 5-4-3 double play. And Ponton feeling a little bit more comfortable right now. I'll tell you, what was really good about that play, even if the player would have been safe at second, he still would have got him at first. We'll take a look as it goes down to second. Because the, the runner was going on the pitch, and he just went through the double play knowing he had enough time to get him at first, and uh, even if he was safe at second, it's a good play going that way. Paul Reardon, the catcher, takes the first pitch low for a ball. He's got to find the play. Come on, Paul. One of the co-captains on the club. Reardon hitting 296, no homers, and eight RBIs, and there he takes a strike. See, that gives a big lift to the pitcher. He just lift, gives him a big lift out there. He gets that double play now. He's got the confidence, and he's feeling good out there. Good breaking ball. Had Reardon bailing out. Came back across the inside corner. So the count one and two Come on, give me a to ball. Paul Reardon. All right. Back against the screen. <clears throat> Reardon missed some time, about a week and a half with a separated shoulder. So he just got back into the lineup earlier last, earlier this week. Went two for four against Dillard. Thought he might be a little bit rusty after the layoff. Two and two, the count to Reardon with two away here in the bottom of the first. Outside, outside. No Going away, and the count goes full. He's 
Normally they go like, usually they go like this. This, this guy goes like this. this. Yeah, Off the it, fist, it, see if it stays just fair. Oh. Just curves foul. A little late, Paul. That's all right. So Reardon comes on back in. Can't will hold it three and two. These clubs met earlier this year with right, Paul, Western beating right Plantation now. seven to nothing. Kristoff got the win. Out of bay. That's it. Chopped at the plate. This is a good at bat. He's fouling him off. Uh, you know, he just blooped one over third. He just banged one back there. But he, what he's doing, he's not letting the umpire call him out on a pitch that's close. And he's making the pitcher throw a lot of pitches. So this is a quality at bat right now. If he gets a walk out of this, he did a good job. Uh, he hits the ball good. It's because he got his pitch. It's a good job, especially against a left-hander. There he goes. He's going to get a hit on this if it stays fair. Another foul ball. He's got nine pitches off this pitcher. He's really done a good job up there. Last ball, right, just Paul, curving foul it. again down the line. Is that and something that's tough to teach, Ed, to a high school youngster, how to get in there and uh, just, you know, <coughs> you hate to, the balls away? You, you hate to see a kid um, get called out with two strikes because, it's again, you're at the high school level, you don't expect big league umpires, and sometimes they're going to call close ones a strike. And All right. Chopper down to first base. De Silva takes it himself. And that's it for Plantation here in the top of the first inning. Now, I know he's not happy with grounding at the first, but he made that pitcher throw 10 pitches. And if he threw 10 pitches to 18 kids, that's 180 pitches. So he's actually done a, a positive job throw that much. So that's it for the Plantation Colonels here in the bottom of the first. No score. We'll be right back. <laughs> George Bianowski warms up as we go to the top of the second inning. No score. If you just join us, I'm Al Southern, and I'm with Ed Waters, the head baseball coach at St. Thomas High School, and we're out here at Plantation High School as the Plantation Colonels with a 10-10 record are hosting the Western Wildcats, who are 9-9-1. District 13-4A battle. Now, you, I'm not sure, but does, in that in that district, do all the teams go into the playoffs, or do they have to fight for the top six? Or I think it's the top ten teams, and I guess, so I guess everyone, there are ten okay. teams in there. So everybody goes in because that's some district. I'll tell you, there's a there's any five or six teams in there that once you get to playoff time can either play the spoiler or actually come back and win it. Teams like Cooper City, that their record isn't that good, but he's got some good players over there. Paul Renon's done a good job there, and they had a rough start and. Those are the type of teams you got to watch out for in the playoffs. They come, they'll come back, and of course you have the powerhouses there. But there's about five, four, five, six teams that are very formidable. Bart Graff was saying that the Cooper City team has some of the best hitters, you know, up and down the lineup that he's seen uh, of anybody they've played this year. Matt Wilson starts it off, goes after the first pitch, and it falls in front of Voracek. So for the second inning in a row, Western gets their leadoff man on by way of a base hit. Second hit off of Mianowski. Take a look at it, that last pitch and the hit. He fought it off. He was, uh, took, used the whole field. That's what you want high school kids to do. You, if you teach using the whole field, you're going to cut down the strikeouts. If the kids are trying to pull, then they're vulnerable to the strikeout. And, Strikeouts and pop-ups are hard to get on base with. You hit the ball on the ground or hit in the line, you got something going. And we're going to have a pinch runner for Matt Wilson. This is number <coughs> 11, Troy Miller, a junior. So he'll stretch it out over at first base. What, uh, are they using speed up or is that uh, hurt? Is he hurt? Scheduled up now is James De Silva, the first baseman. As you take a look at Troy Miller. And De Silva squares around a bunt. The quick throw down to first base. Very close, very close. Oh. <clears throat> Not by much. Miller back in there. Going for the bunt again. They mustn't have too much confidence in their hitting. Well, De Silva's had a, a tough time, Ed, hitting just uh, 191. 
no homers and four RBIs. Said part of the problem uh, he's been having, uh, getting jammed at the plate, going after some bad pitches. Squares around a bunt again and lays it down nicely. Quickly out is Reardon. Fires over to first base, but the sacrifice works as Miller ends up at second base. So good job by James De Silva giving himself up. It's kind of a catch-22 if your team's not hitting and then you're giving up four or five outs on bunts and you're not hitting, it gives you less chances to knock them in. It kind of hurts you both ways. Take another look at it, Ed, and okay, Reardon did a pretty good job covering up on that. You always want to make sure of one out. You want to make sure of one. Even if you give them the sacrifice, if you had a 50-50 chance, get the out at first base. You don't want to give them the big inning by making a bad throw. The number eight man in the order, Frank Stokes. He's a senior and the captain of this Western club. Hitting just 096. Takes a strike. Fish look a little bit high, but he called it a strike, so I guess it was. <clears throat> oh! Curveball. And it's 2-0. and oh. Excuse me, 1-1. One and one. The next couple of innings should really be the pitchers because we're going to be in twilight for a couple of innings, and that's the time to really challenge them upstairs. Good play, good play. Miller has uh, got back by the skin of his teeth twice, once at first base and now at second base. A good move by Mianowski. He's having a... Uh, take another look at and just see how close it was. Oh, well, might have got back in there. He's getting down a little late in the slides. He, he's making a mistake by looking at the fielder instead of keeping his eye on the ball. And that's what you want as a pitcher and an infielder. That's what you want the, the runner to do is take his eye off the ball. Call strike to Stokes. Oh, yeah. At the fastball. <clears throat> Frank has had some problems at his play, as you can tell by the average. Leads the team in strikeouts. He struck out 15 times this year. Usually, doesn't bat. Usually, they put a DH in for him. But decided to give him a shot here tonight. He watched the breaking ball stay high and works the count full. Three and two, one out. Western has a runner down at second base. No score as we're top of the second inning. And that's strikeout number 16 for Frank Stokes. And the third one of the game for Mianowski. Take another look at the last pitch. He went after a high pitch. He's, he's right on top of the plate, so he looks like he's not confident up there. He's jamming himself right off the bat when he's that close to the plate. Iacovone. And he takes the ball. Hitting 204. No homers, six RBIs. I think you'll see this big kid go to the fastball for the next couple innings because it's getting a little tough to see up there right now. And I think he can overpower these guys with his fastball. The way the field's laid out, the sun's setting just over the third baseline, right about at the tree line now. Fastball a little bit high. Two and one. Third ball, right on the corner, and that evens it at 2-2. The first base coach is a little unhappy with that call. We got him, we got him now. The assistant coach, Justin Gates. Now once again, Mianowski goes 3-2. Because, you know, I never argue with umpires. And that's why you can't talk this afternoon, right? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have <laughs> a few conversations with the umpires. Ball four. 
And Mianowski lets him get away. So the number nine man draws a walk, the second base on balls for the Wildcats in the first two innings. And they now have runners at first and second with two outs. And we come to the top of the Western order. Chab Lukoski, who bounced a single over third baseman Todd Gumowitz to start the game off. Good pitch. Comes back with a breaking ball. Lukoski starting the game hitting 260. Good pitch. Evens the count at one and one. One of the big problems for Western this year has been clutch hits. See if they can come through now. I think the pitch is a little upset with himself walking the ninth hitter. And he's trying to overthrow the ball right now. He doesn't have to do that. He should just throw his normal way and he'll be fine. And that's something you really can't teach, is it, Ed? The clutch hits, you try to get the kids to be uh, calm and uh, bad as usual when they've got runners on base. Right oh. back up the middle, and we've got a base hit. Here Good comes up. the runner around second, and the throw. It won't be in time. Back to second base, everybody's safe. This kid, uh, number 11, just heard his foot coming around there. Miller limping into the dugout after scoring the first run this afternoon. Troy Miller. Hustling all the way from second base on the base hit up the middle. And Western takes a one to nothing lead. <clears throat> the shortstop did exactly what you tell the kids to do with two out and men in scoring positions to knock the ball down. But in that case, it actually hurt him. If the ball would have went through, I think they probably would have held the kid at third. But that's what you want Jane Fields to do. Get dirty, knock the ball down the hole. He made a great try at it. And again, the uh, leadoff hitter put the ball in play. And that's uh, what you've got to do. That was a big hit right there because, as I said before, I think that while, it gets, while it's getting dark, it's going to be real tough on the hitting. One run could be big in this ball game. On the replay, you saw Miller crossing and played, and that looks he like where he ankle. may have uh, turned yeah. his ankle. Mike Hudson, the right fielder, struck out in the first inning. He's got runners at first and second. Still two outs. And I know the pitcher's thinking, if I didn't walk that ninth hitter, I wouldn't be in this jam right now. And you can see he's visibly shaking out there in the mound. Reardon comes out and has a quick word, trying to calm him down. You can just see it all over George's face, you know, how upset he is. Yeah. He's got a good arm. He throws the ball well. He's got to get his poise back and stay in the ball game. High pop-up, out of play. <clears throat> one and one the count to Mike Hudson. Western team, as we said before, very young team. In fact, the entire infield will return for next season. And consistency has been a big part of their problem this year. Good breaking ball, one and two. Rainowski would like to end it right here, and he does. Well, he, he came gets back his, good. Came back good. Gets his fourth strikeout, or make that the fifth strikeout of the game, as Kristoff goes down, or Hudson goes down for the second time, and we go to the bottom of the second inning. Western has broken on top by the score of one to nothing. For the Colonels. That's a big kid right here. I've heard he's a pretty good pitcher, too. I haven't seen him throw. I heard he was pretty good. Sean Fisher hitting 389, leading the club. No homers and 12 RBIs. Probably the most versatile player on the team. As Ed mentioned, he pitches. Also plays the outfield. Had a three-hitter earlier this week with 15 strikeouts as they beat Dillard 6-1. to 
and leads the team in the batting average as well as hits, RBIs, and doubles. I think he pitched a no-hitter earlier in the year also. Pontan out in front, two strikes to Fisher. Last ball just outside. Good pitcher. We go after the curveball. And that is the first strikeout. Take a look at the last pitch, and that's a good pitch. Sean was about as dark in it as uh, the picture looked. Right. Right that <laughs> Here's the pitcher, George Mianowski. George hitting 273, no homers, two RBIs, a strict pull hitter. Another one of the uh, Colonels who had a good game this week against Plant against Dillard. He was two for four and had four stolen bases. Ponton falls behind. Two balls. Now gets the call strike. Oh. Popped up and out of play. George, as we said, uh, transferred down from Canada and did, didn't have anything to do with his parents moving down, but uh, has a grandmother in the area who uh, has been ill and has kind of moved in to keep an eye on her. So a long way from home without uh, his main family, parents, brothers, and sisters. I'm sure he's fitted down here in a new country and uh, seems to be adapting pretty well. Seems as if th this is probably warm to him where some of the kids from Florida think it's a little cool tonight. <laughs> That's true. This is probably perfect weather. Taps it foul to his coach, Bart Graff, down at third base. Count full at three and two. Pops this one out of play. He almost hit that one at Coach McQuaid's house. Coach McQuaid lives right down the right block. Right down. Well, he gets a good eye, keeps an eye on what's going on around <laughs> here. It's, uh, Coach McQuaid from Nova. Nova High School. And they've got a big tournament coming up. Yeah, starting up, next week. Which opens this Saturday. Break. Yeah, mm -hmm. we play, I think, the, I don't know if it's opening game or second game at uh, 4 o'clock against Coral Springs at Nova High School. Teams from all over the, well, there's teams from New Jersey and all over Florida. Should be a good tournament. 3-2 pitch again in the dirt. Yeah. Out of play. Mianowski hustling down as the ball gets away from Bottleson. But he'll hold it first base. Got a lot of room back there. Second walk given up by Joey Ponton. So with one out here in the bottom of the second inning, the Colonel's going to run her on as Aaron Voracek steps in. Voracek, the junior, hitting 185. One homer and 10 RBIs. And he's another transfer. He came from Arizona. As he takes a fastball low and away. Voracek hitting just 185, but the 10 hits that he has, he's made the most of them. He's got four doubles, a triple, and a home run. The only player on the team to have a Three bagger and a home run. One ball delivery. And there goes Mianowski. And he's out of there. And he's caught. Nice throw by the catcher. <laughs> that was Billy Goldman making the tag. So Mianowski trying to pick up his fifth stolen base of the week. Gets caught and that's the second out. Take a look at it one more time, Ed. Catcher did the right thing, just threw to the bag and 
make your infielders get there and cover. Just don't look for them. Just throw to the bag, and that's what he did. And they got there and made the play. One and one. The count to Voracek. Ponton had that one slip a little bit on him as he let go. Two balls, one strike, two outs, bottom of the second inning. It's it back to the shortstop, Jim Iacoboni. And that'll do it for Plantation here in the bottom of the second inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. So another one, two, three inning. For Joey Ponton as we go to the top of the third, Western leading one to nothing. Our newscasts and headlines are filled with stories about young people who have started their lives on the wrong side of the law. The Broward Sheriff's Office Police Athletic League program provides a great alternative to crime and drugs, so accessible to our kids today. Please join me, along with well heavyweight champ Muhammad Ali, at a special event that will benefit the Police Athletic League programs. The Challenge, Friday, April 27th at 7 p.m. at the Thunderbird Swap Shop. For more information, call 720-2241. National Cable Month, TV you've got to see. For pay-per-view entertainment made to order, check out Viewer's Choice in April. Blasting into your home, it's Batman, the mega hit of the decade. Gene Hackman in the explosive thriller, The Package. Brian De Palma's harrowing vision of Vietnam, Casualties of War. And Tom Selleck in the gritty prison drama, An Innocent Man. All in April on Viewer's Choice. Tune in and take a look. April is National Cable Month, TV you've got to see. Well, Belk, welcome back to another edition of Inside Broward Sports. High school baseball this week as we've got the Plantation Colonels hosting the Western Wildcats. We move on to the top of the third inning. And for the Western will be number three, four, and five batters. They have a one to nothing lead over George Mianowski and the Plantation Colonels. Bob Kristoff will start it off. Kristoff. Struck out in the first inning. Started the day hitting 300, which leads this Wildcat club. Wildcats coached by Kenny Smith, who played his high school ball right down the road at uh, South Broward and uh, was coached by a compatriot of yours, Eddie, is uh, Len Cook. Hey, Len's had a lot of good ball players there come through his program. Kenny, of course, went on to pitch in um, professional baseball and was a very strong uh, teacher with fundamentals of pitching. You can tell those, just the way the left-hander worked, the kid with two strikes last inning, the way he went away and came back with a curve against a good hitter. That's Kenny's work with him. Gumowitz at third, over to Fisher for the first out. Kenny played, uh, Ken Smith played for a couple of excellent managers up there in Florida State. I think his first year sure. at Dick Hauser and mm -hmm. then uh, Mike Martin. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Mike Martin's done a tremendous job there. Of course, Hauser before him did a tremendous job and then went on to the pros in coaching. I played some semi-pro ball with Kenny after he was out of the minors and I was out of the minors. We played on some semi-pro teams around here. and He's a pitcher. He knows exactly what he's doing with the ball and that's what he passes on to these high school pitchers, and then it's going to really help them out. Tom Bottleson, the catcher, watches a breaking ball skid by for ball one, and now a fastball outside. So Mianowski now behind 2-0. and oh. Christoph also, or er, Bottleson, walked in the first inning, hitting 256. Nice. Mianowski comes back with a fastball, but Don Fowler, the home plate umpire, says a little bit low and outside. Ooh. 
So four straight pitches. And that is the third walk given up by Mianowski. Bottleson down the first with one out. Like and that'll bring up mom. the second baseman, like Billy Goodman, or Billy Goldman. Party. I think the coach from Plantation, I think Brad was asking his catcher if he was coming up on those pitches and taking a good shot away from the umpire because he thought those were two pretty good looking pitches. The main thing you're looking for from the umpires is to give you a consistent strikes on the whole game. If it varies, it really can upset a pitcher. If it's low one inning and high the next inning. Well, this is a good Goldman lifts one down the line for a base hit. Horacek having problems with it. Bottleson heading to third. Here's the throw. Gubowitz has it pop up. Now down to second base. Heads up base running by Goldman as he moves on to second. On the throw to third. Everything went right that time for Western. Good heads up base running and good hustle. Billy Goldman lofts a base hit into short right field. Bottleson ends up base running, ends up at third, and Goldman doing the same. So now for Western, runners at second and third with just one out. Looks like they had to hit and run on, on that one and work perfect. Designated hitter Matt Wilson steps in. Wilson, the junior, hitting 290. A little anxious in that first pitch. Might be looking for something here. They're, if they're not that confident in their hitting, another run right would be big for them right here. They might have something going. Of course, uh, Kenny playing for Len Cook knows what it means to squeeze bunt. Wilson. Bang to hit up the middle, his first time up. Fastball, a little bit high. And now Bart Graff out of the dugout. Kind of comes out halfway, it says his piece, and heads back. Mianowski from the full windup. Fastball, that one definitely high. So the big junior right-hander having some early control problems here in the third inning. Now he gets the call on the fastball. Ends it up at two and two. Out of play. Right there. At one point, uh, do you, Ed, as a manager, come out and uh, talk to your pitcher when he's having some control problems or maybe not getting the calls that he thinks he should? If you see he's visibly lost his poise, you want to go out and calm him down. I think that's one of the biggest attributes you need as a pitcher is to have poise. Way up high, and it's a full count. Sometimes it's good to get him real early with that and just try to talk to him, calm him down, and tell him that you got to do the best you can. You can't let the umpire. On the inside corner, he gets the call strike, and Matt Wilson now upset. As he is called out on strikes, and that is the sixth strikeout. Take a look from center field. I looked a little low. Looked a little low, but. I guess it's going to stand, and uh, James De Silva now up to him with two outs and two on. Takes ball one. It's nice being up here, and I don't have to argue any calls. <laughs> you never argue, are they? They're just it's debate. disagreements. Yeah, debates. It's there we go. Off the end of the bat, Fisher will take it himself. And the Colonels get out of trouble here at the top of the third inning. For Western, no runs. They get a base hit. They leave a couple. And as we go to the bottom of the third inning, for Western on top, one to nothing. Hudson right there and 
takes it for out number one. All right, Todd, come on, we need a hit, break it open. It only looks like the lights are taking effect because he seemed to see that okay. I think we're just about past the twilight time here as the sun uh, totally out of view. Uh, 95% of the lighting coming from the lights here at the stadium. Todd Gumowitz, the third baseman. Gumowitz hitting 244, no homers, two RBIs. He's a senior, didn't play last year, had problems with his studies, but really has applied himself, and right now he's got better than a 3-0 average. Oh, all right. good, good, cut, good, cut. good cut at a fastball, and it's one and one. Look at the last pitch, Ed. He challenged him and got it by him. He took a good cut, but... Huh? Say he goes around. So it's now one and two to Gumowitz. All right, hang in there, boy, hang in. Check the play. Gumowitz was somewhat of a slump, but really picked it up over the last week. About six for 18. I was calling him in a strike. He got the ball off to the end of the bat. He said he went around. Give Ponton credit for the strikeout, but well, or Gumowitz ends up down at first base on the, what are you going to call it, Ed? Wild pitch? I guess you got to call ball? it wild pitch. It looks like the ball hit the ground. You can't blame the catcher on that. He tried to get his body out in front. Yeah, I don't know. Right. What the catcher wants to do, on a, or any fielder when they want to keep the ball in front of him, is try to hunch the shoulders in so the ball drops straight down, but it, that one caromed off before he could do that. Watch it, watch the pitch out. The number nine man, Jason Donahue, steps in and he oh. squares around the bunt. Oh. Throw down to first. Oh, they threw it away. Out of the right field, oh. but quickly backing up the play is Hudson. So no opportunity for Gumbelwitz to move up. Tom Bottleson coming up quickly to throw after the pitch. Good idea, but to throw a little bit offline. Heads up play by Hudson. Come up quickly from the right field spot. Donahue hitting just 154. His first year on the varsity. Back. Move towards first. You gotta have a lead, Todd. It's real tough to call anything on a left-hander in high school with two umpires. It's hard for them to see whether his foot's going past the rubber or not. Go, 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 go. Down the bunt, Lukoski. Good job by Jim De Silva over at first base as he gets the wide throw and comes back up to make the tag for the putout. But the sacrifice is successful as Gumowitz moves on up to second. All right, Claude. Come on, Claude. You look at the bunt. <clears throat> Once the third baseman takes the ball, the pitcher's got to get to third, and he's he's standing there. Now, if the guy was running all the way, he could have went from first to third. Now the third baseman rushes over. Top of the order, and Claude Love, who walked in the first inning, hitting 250. Once again, just his second varsity game. Played on the JV until Tuesday, where they pulled him in against Dillard. Came through with a base hit and an RBI. Third baseman, Lakowski, in on the edge of the grass looking for another possible bunt. Love squares around, doesn't offer at it. Count to love, 2-0. Oh. Come on, Claude. Watch it. Ponton steps back. You saw our scoreboard. We do have two outs as Matt Malinsky hit off the inning, led off the inning with a fly out and then uh, Donahue outside, retired outside, on a sacrifice. Now Love works the count three and zero. Oh. Yeah. 
It's uh, way up high. For Brad Love. Doing the job as a leadoff hitter with two walks. Third walk of the evening for Joey Ponton and Ken Smith comes out of the Western dugout and is going to have a word. Nobody's been warming up. Although the Wildcats did have somebody up and throwing in the very first inning as Ponton ran into some problems. He's been working with men on base each of the first three innings, but has been able to get out of trouble. They got that nice double play in the, That's in the right. first inning. So the Colonels have runners at first with Claude Love down at second, Todd Gumowitz. Two outs. And the batter is left fielder Brad Sheets, who hit into that 5 4 3 double play in the first we got, inning. We got to get more of the lead, man. Sheets started the day hitting 222. Looks at one low and away. Mark Graff call sheets a pretty good contact hitter. The thing they've been trying to get him to do is to move the ball around the field a little bit more. Bonta loses it way up high, and we do start to see now some action in the Wildcats' bullpen. First and third, then they can run a steal. Okay, they can steal. Erwin Lopez, right-hander, is the youngster warming up for Western. Ponton hey. makes the move towards second base, but really nothing going on. I wonder if there's ever be a time when someone fakes the second that someone doesn't yell balk in the stadium. <laughs> I was just going to ask you about that. You really get tired of hearing that. Two and one to Sheets. Ponta checks the runner down a second. And timeout is called. Sheets asks home plate umpire Don Fowler for a moment's time. Left side of the Western infield playing kind of shallow. Oh, ball. Oh. This is outside and it's three and one. Well, if he's a good contact hitter, I know it's you don't want the man being thrown out of third to end the inning, but if he's a good contact hitter, that ball is around the plate, he should be swinging. You might want to get something going here. Sheet steps out, takes a look down to Coach Mark Raff. Down at third base. Gumowitz at second, Love at first, two outs, and the 3 1 pitch inside. So the second consecutive walk for Joey Ponton, and that loads him up. Hanging on the edge of the dugout. Hasn't made a move Paul, yet. Watch the ball. Paul Reardon. Left hander will now step in for the Colonels. Grounded out to third his first time up. Reardon's one of the guys that the Colonels would like to have in at this situation. 296. Eight RBIs. Yeah, me too. Oh, good time. Another breaking ball on the inside corner. So Ponton quickly out in front, 0-2. Come on, Todd, score on the home on the pass ball. All right, ball. The last time against the other lefty, the big kid, uh, Fisher, he did the same thing 0 2. He threw hard away and came back with the curveball 0 and 2 and got him on the. Let's see if he works the same way with this left if he comes back with the breaking pitch here. 
Kenny Smith comes out of the dugout and shifts his outfield over towards left. Of course, Reardon was the one that did real good at bat last time, fouling off about three full count pitches. So. He really hung in there tough, and he got to see a lot of what Pontown is throwing. He made the adjustment with two strikes. So. Now just trying to fight to check the plate. This ball a little bit inside. Long drive, baby. One two pitch, breaking ball, and he gets it. To give Joey Ponton a lot of credit, the youngster looked like he was going to lose it. Comes back to strike out Reardon with the bases loaded, his second strike out of the inning, and get out of trouble. So for the Colonels, no runs, no hits, no errors, three men left, and we played three full innings. Western still hanging on to a one to nothing lead. National Cable Month, TV you've got to see. For pay-per-view entertainment made to order, check out Viewer's Choice in April. We interrupt this commercial to bring you a special report. Continental Cablevision now offers you not one, not two, but three hot new numbers. They're the all-new pay-per-view hotlines. Call today and every day and find out what's hot on pay-per-view. We now return you to normally scheduled programming. Tune in and take a look. April is National Cable Month, TV you Frank Stokes will lead it off for Western as we move on to the top of the fourth inning. Al Southerd along with St. Thomas coach Ed Waters. And we're glad you've joined us tonight on Inside Broward Sports as we're at Plantation High School. The District 13 4A battle between Western and Plantation. One to nothing, Western on top. Stokes struck out his first time back in the second inning. Started the game hitting just 0 96. And he takes strike one from George Bianowski. Curveball in the dirt. How much wind does that take out of you, Ed, being plantation last inning, bases loaded, a chance to tie the game up and not able to get that clutch hit? Well, the fact that it's a one-nothing ball game, it, you're still in there, but um, you always want to see that two-out hit, and that really picks you up, really gives you a, a boost, and good things seem to happen after that when you can get that. There's so much to this game that's mental that you have to really stay on top of it. Two and two, the count to Stokes. Breaking ball. Hey, this is the number eight so it here. runs full. And I think last time he handled this kid pretty good with the fastball. Now he's gone full on him, and he didn't come close on the fastball last time. Man. You know, that hurts. He, he walks this, this eighth hitter who, would you said, 17 strikeouts. Not the guy that you want to get on by a walk, and it's the fourth base on balls by Mianowski. I think Bart's going to remind him what part of the order he has right here, and don't try to be too cute. Challenge him. You're playing at night, so it adds a little bit on your fastball. And this kid has a good fastball. Here you take a look at Bart Graff, number 21, his first year as the head coach, as he succeeded Frank Hepler here at Plantation. Bart to uh, play his college ball up in Ohio. And I asked him how he came to move to Florida. And he said his college, uh, that he went to Defiance College, came down here every year for some games in the spring. And fell in love. That was a pretty good place to, <laughs> to spend the year, especially for somebody who loves baseball. Yeah, I made that decision 19 years ago. <laughs> Iacovoni. Takes the first pitch, low and away. He walked back in the second inning. I think this big catcher is giving the umpire a tough time on the low pitches because those pitches look pretty good, and he's calling them low. Good job by Fisher blocking the ball. And the 
Low pickoff throw to first. Lays the ball down, but rolls foul and scooped up by Fisher. That'd be quite a collision if their first baseman and catcher hit. A couple of big guys. Big kids on this plantation team. One and one. Nobody out. Runner at first as we're in the top of the fourth inning. And Akavone jumps at the ball as he tries to lay it down. And now behind one and two, takes a look at Ken Smith. I know Kenny would like to get this run of the second with that leadoff hitter coming up. The leadoff hitter seems to have the best idea up there at the plate. <coughs> He's had the two hits so far. Mianowski set for the 2 2 pitch. He's got it. And the runner going. Really nice throw. So nice it turns out to be his double play for the Colonels as Akaboni goes down looking and they get Stokes trying to steal second. Now they should get some momentum out of that. Now that, that should get really pick them up. They should get this next out and come in here all pumped up. They got this leadoff hitter with nobody on coming coming up. The guy that drove in the only run. He can't hurt him now with a base hit. And this should give him a good lift. They can get out of it right here. The leadoff man, Chad Lakowski, is a couple of base hits in an RBI tonight. Breaking ball outside. The pitcher's really, right now, he's, in, he's totally confused with the strike zone that he's getting from this umpire. Pitches that he wants to throw are being called balls, and pitches that are getting called strikes are pitches that he doesn't think are strikes. So that really confuses a kid. And uh, that's why when you hear a coach yell at an umpire, be consistent. They want to know what his strike zone is going to be. And they can then you can adjust to it. And that should be, this should really pick them up. They should be all keyed up coming in here after the, the double play on the strikeout. The Gilo to Fisher for the third out. So we move on to the bottom of the fourth inning. Plantation trying to close the gap. They trail one to nothing. Move on to the bottom of the fourth inning. Ponton has got himself out of jams in just about every inning so far, Ed, either by way of a double play or some uh, key strikeouts, as he did last inning. He's been able to hold the Colonel scoreless through the first three at-bats. Right now, he'll start off against the first baseman, Sean Fisher. I need, they need this big kid to get him going here. He needs to get a, something for him here. He can stay off that curveball and you get a fastball. I think he might get him going. He's got a quick bat. Fisher started the there night it is. 289, and he drills this one to center field. Over the head of Bob Kristoff. He needs to stop at second there. He needs to stop at second. Don't get thrown out at third. That's exactly what they needed right there. The big kid had to give him a shot in the arm. He did. He hit that ball nice. You know, the first hit of the evening by the Colonels. And it's a double to straightaway center field from Sean Fisher. So now the pitcher, George Mianowski, with a chance to help himself. And we'll take another look at. Well, he got right down on that fastball. It was a fastball down the middle and low. And you always hear that left-handers are good low ball hitters. And he just, he was all over that. You know, it looked like he was swinging down. But when the follow through came, he hit it just like a four iron. Head was right down in the pitch. Mianowski walked his first time up. <clears throat> George hitting 273. He looks like he has a better swing than his batting average. Holds up and the count goes 2 0. Oh. 
You should get a good pitch here. 2 0. He doesn't want to walk him. And... Guess this is outside. <clears throat> so 3 0 is the count. Ponton has already walked four batters in the first three innings. Comes back with a fastball for a strike. Eventually the walks are going to kill you. They're going to catch you somewhere along the line if you keep walking batters. The 3-1 delivery. Chopped in the dirt, rolling slowly towards first base, but rolls foul and De Silva scoops it up. So Minowski will return now with a full count after being ahead 3-0. and We'll see what Ponton decides to go to here. It's way up high. So he loses Mianowski on a 3-2 count, his fifth walk of the evening. And it gives the Colonels runners at first and second with nobody out. This is the kid with the extra base hit power on their team, too. He's got the seven extra base hits on the line. Right, Aaron Voracek. So his hits are for power when he gets them. He hit the ball last time. And Orchick rounded out in the second inning. Once again, not hitting for average, but he's been making his hits count. Got him he's got 10 RBIs with a 185 average. Lays it down, they go to third, they've got him. Ooh. Close play at third. We'll have to look at the replay, I'm sure, on that one. Strong throw by Joey Ponton, and they get him by a blink of an eye. So there's one away. The runners now become Mianowski down in second base and Voracek at first and another look the last play. Oh, I tell you what, not, not to see that one again. <laughs> yeah, you need the uh, super slow micro motion to <laughs> tell for sure. But anyway, there's one out, still runners at first and second, and this is Matt Malinsky. And Malinsky flying out back in the third inning. I think he the fly ball to right field when it was just getting dark. <clears throat> on, man. Come on, man. Oh. Back against the screen. He wants that pitch again. He could see after he took that cut that he thought that was the one he was going to hit good. He had a good swing at it. One and one the count with one out, bottom of the fourth inning. Colonels trying to even things up as they trail one to nothing, but threatening with runners at first and second. Fontan checks the runner at second. Curveball just outside. We got some uh, warm up action in the bullpen again. They get the right hander up, number three, I believe. I think that's Erwin Lopez, who was warming up before. Gets the call. Evens it up at two and two. He just didn't pull the trigger. I think he must have been looking breaking pitch because that was right where he wanted it. Two balls, two strikes, one out. Montag in a familiar, familiar situation, trying to work out of trouble. Let's the curveball get away. And another full count on Matt Milaninski. Runner's going. Oh, look at this. Chopper, it's going to be perfect. 
Perfect hit and run. Mianaski coming across to score, and we've got a tie ball game. That was a real good call by the coach there. So on a 3-2 pitch, Matt Molinsky pounds one, a high chopper to the right side, and a run scores. Take another look at it, Ed. Boy, he put it right through the open hole. Even though he was battling with a full count, he still had to protect the plate, and with the runners moving, makes things happen. If the guy's there, they'll at least get a force out. So I like that. They're down one, they're running. It's a good play. Aaron Voracek ends up at third base, and Matt Malinsky with the RBI single to tie things up down at first. And there's one of those walks coming back to haunt him. Brendan Scored was one of the players who walked. So Joey Ponton, luck finally beginning to stretch a little bit. Todd Gumowitz, the third baseman. Now they got that first and third situation and they got a tie game and they're the home team so they can play around a little bit. Gumowitz squares around as if the bunt takes a fastball on the corner. Gumowitz was called out on strikes back in the third inning but the ball getting away, a wild pitch charge to Ponton and he ended up at first base. One strike pitch. Breaking ball. Just behind the home plate area. And it's 0-2. What do you say, Todd? James, got any coach got something on here with the first and third. I saw him just showing the runner at first where his left hander's knee going back behind the rubber when the lead. I think he wants to put something on here. Yeah. You got him. See, there it is. You have him going. Now they're going to send him home. Four check so out third, and here he comes. Here's just the throw. He's got him. He's out of there. Good play by the catcher. Good job by Tom Bottleson to block the plate, make the tag. And a big second out recorded by the Wildcats. Yeah, they had the first move on the lefty play on in first and third and Holy almost God. got away with it. Take another look at it, Ed. And once the man, once the first baseman threw it to the infielder at the second base, the man from third was breaking. Yep, he was he was out because he never got to the bag. Uh, his body was around the catcher, but he didn't roll on the plate until after the tag. It's a good call by the young. Good throw by the shortstop, Iacovoni. Good eye. Bottleson asks for timeout. Heads out towards the mound. Two and two the count on Todd Gumowitz. Two outs, runner down at second. ball. <laughs> Ponton really wanted that one. That looked a little high. And the count goes full again. Even if Ponton works out of this, he's thrown a lot of pitches yeah. the first few innings. He, this may be his last inning of work. Breaking ball. This time he gets him. As Todd Gumowitz goes down on strikes, it's the third strikeout of the evening. But for the Colonels, they come up with a tying run here in the fourth inning on a couple of base hits, no errors. They leave a runner, and we play four full innings. Tied at one. George Mianowski now back to even as he's Got a, picked up a run. This ball cup last inning. In fact, 
George scored the tying run and we're one to one as we go to the top of the fifth inning. The two, three, and four batters for Western coming up. Mike Hudson, the right fielder, will start it off and he has twice been a strikeout victim. Fouls the first pitch up and out of play behind home plate. And get somebody's car. The crowd on their feet. Everybody's cheering except the poor person that owns the car. <laughs> Somebody just walking back there to take a look. Besides having the parking very close to the field, uh, the street runs right behind the ballpark. So you got, if you're not here at the game, just driving by, you've got a chance of getting tagged once in a while too. Oh yeah. Fastball. Hudson goes around and it's two strikes. Good fastball. Hit by on the outside corner. And that's strikeout number eight for Mianowski. He just overpowered him right there. He just saw he could get the fastball by him and stayed with it. That was a good pitch right there. <clears throat> Bob Kristoff has struck out and grounded out. Kristoff started the evening at even 300. Now with the weather cooling down a bit now as we get farther on into the evening, George uh, Mianowski out of Canada probably feeling uh, more and more at home. Starting to loosen up out there on the map. Curveball gets away from him. Throws a couple of types of curveball, according to Coach Bart Graff. One where he comes basically overhand like his other deliveries. And then he'll drop the arm a little bit to get a little different rotation on the ball. His numbers going into today, one and two record with a 2.55 earned run average, 37 strikeouts in just 22 innings, 15 walks, team batting average against him, just 214. He's throwing hard now. He's throwing as hard as he's thrown all game. That's what you like to see in a pitcher is get stronger as he goes. And, well, he's built he's built to go strong. He's, Stocky, he's strong looking legs. Looking in for the signal, the 2 2 delivery to Kristoff. Up high. Tom Bottleson, the on deck catcher for the Wildcats, on deck batter. Third ball in the dirt. So Kristoff bites off Mianowski and draws a walk, and that is the fifth walk this evening by Mianowski. In that situation, they, I don't think the batter's shown him he can hit the fastball real well. I'm surprised he didn't challenge him. One out, one on. Bottleson has walked twice. Hitting 256. Takes a fastball up high. Bottleson with two home runs. Tied for the team lead along with Bobby Kristoff. Reaches for this pitch and fouls it off behind first base. I guess congratulations uh, 
in store for you, Ed. You've been selected to uh, be one of the coaches for the Southeast team. that will be bringing some of the kids from this area up to uh, a tournament next month up in Baseball City. Yeah, that's a, Len Cook asked me to help him out, and then, of course, it was easy to answer that. <laughs> Runner going. Ball gets away from Reardon. But they record the strikeout, I believe. I think the catch is upset that the batter interfered with him. And uh, that is a rule in high school of, or any level of ball. But if the, catch, the batter gets in the bat way of the catcher, he has to be able to throw. And it's in the umpire's judgment of whether or not he thinks it's interference. So you can see the way he threw the ball, that he was in something impeded the way he threw the ball. Bart Graff just came out for a quick comment, but headed back into the dugout. So the count goes to two and one. Maybe we First off, picks up the stolen base. Did we get a look at that one? Mm. There's the last pitch. Well, it's hard to say who moved into who right there. Popped up over towards the Wildcats dugout. Reardon takes a look. That goes back and out of play. That's where my van is. <laughs> yeah, you should have known better. Your baseball <laughs> coach like you knows where to park. I always park with the park. back windows facing. If they're going to get anything, get the back windows. That's right. Not that expensive windshield. Count even at two and two to Bottleson. One out, one on. We're in the top of the fifth inning. Score tied at one. Comes in with a fastball, but this is outside and goes to the full count again. I think if they want to, they can put a play on this runner at second. I think if they move in behind, they got a chance to pick him off second. He's taking an aggressive lead, but I think he's we're looking for it. Fastball, oh, that's ball. it down the line, past Gumowitz. That's going to score the run. It should be a double. Kristoff coming across, and it's a two-to-one ball game. Bottleson in the second with a double. That was a nice swing right there. He put that ball right inside the line. So for Tom Bottleson, his second double of the year, drives in a run. Inside pitch, he hit it right where his pitch, got down and got it. And Drove it down the line. And you see Bobby Kristoff coming around third, and he scores easily after getting on by way of the walk and the stolen base. And the Wildcats able to capitalize on it here in the top of the fifth inning. So that steal play with the catcher feeling as if it, he was interfered with the big play here. Billy Goldman is one for two. Struck out and singled. He takes the first pitch for a strike. Still just one out. Runner down at second. Mianowski gets him a chase. Curve ball off the outside corner. Once again, you can see the frustration and the anguish on George's face. He knows that situation created by himself, letting the guy on by way of the walk. Ready for the two strike pitch. No three straight pitches and Goldman strikes out for the second time. Strikeout number nine for Mianowski. First run in the second inning and then struck out in the third. <laughs> First call strike. And from up here it looked a little high, and I think it looks Wilson high from up here. It, it must be high because we're pretty high up up here. <laughs> <laughs> As I said before, it's nice. I don't have to argue. Let Bart argue with him. I'm sure that's what you'll hear from some of the plantation fans. One ball, one strike, two outs. 
Curveball. That's two and one. Comes back with a fastball. Reardon holding it there for effect to let the umpire take a good long look at it, but it doesn't help. And it's three and one. Wilson taking all the way and fastball on the outside corner. So it's a full count. Last ball, that one looked a little bit high, but Wilson wasn't going to take a chance and bounce it straight back. Again, the 3 2 pitch. Lights it off. Miaski looking right back up the middle. See his teammate Tom Bottleson down at second. But it's ruled on the curveball. I think he was just a fastball on that one, Ed, and yeah, he just couldn't react. So it's the 10th strikeout, but in the inning, the Wildcats come up with a run on a base hit. They leave a runner, and we go to the bottom of the fifth. Two to one, Western on top. Even with all the walks and everything, the game's moving along pretty quick. In the first four innings, all right, so we've got a new pitcher is Bob Kristoff and uh, Joey Ponton switch positions. Kristoff moves in from center field. Ponton moves to the outfield. Bobby Kristoff, who is the number one pitcher on the Western staff with a 4-4 four and four record, a 2.03 earned run average. He won seven innings earlier this week against Miramar. And Kenny Smith said that he might bring him in tonight late in the game. They needed to close it out. And here with a two to one lead, they're gonna make the move to Kristoff and try and seal off the Colonels for their final three at bats. Well, I know there's about three or four hitters in the, the plantation lineup that are happy to see the right-hander come in. They've been batting against the lefty and even if they hit the ball against the lefty, they'd like to see a righty more than a lefty because they don't see as many lefties. in the Left-handers always seem to have the advantage because the righties don't see a lot of them, and the lefties in high school seem to have a big problem with them. So I know that Reardon and Fisher are glad to see the right-hander in there and love the leadoff hitter. So they've got a little psychological boost seeing a right-hander come in. Even though he is their ace pitcher, they see the ball a lot better off the righty. So Jason Donahue, the shortstop and number nine man in the order, will begin things here in the bottom of the fifth. Sacrificed in the third inning. Started the day hitting 154. So we'll see how Bobby Kristoff has loosened up. Ed, maybe you can uh, run by the rule that was instituted this year as far as uh, the number of pitches or number of innings that a pitcher can go during a week's time or uh, a certain period of time in high school ball. Well, I know the interpretation now, the way it's written doesn't, it, it's kind of ambiguous the way it's written. It, it, that's a nice shot. High ball and Ponton racing back, racing oh, back. what a nice Great catch. catch. Well, Joey Ponton <laughs> moving out to play defense. And high fives all over in the outfield. The hitter still can't believe it. He's standing on second base. He thought it was in there. He's still he can't hit it much harder. He looked like that. Joe DiMaggio when Gene Frito made that catch in the 41 World Series or whatever. Let's take another look as Jason Donahue hit this one right on the nose. You see Ponton going back, back, and Boy, he did it. With it. He made a per he just ran hard to the spot and uh, didn't put his arm out too soon and didn't slow himself down. That was an excellent catch. Go, 14. Top of the order is Claude Love. 
steps in. He has walked twice this evening. <clears throat> the way I understand the rule and the way now it's explained is you, you can pitch 14 innings in a week if it's not in consecutive games. Say 14, bad. And you can't pitch more than 10 innings. It says in the, the rule consecutive days, but it's also supposed to mean you can't pitch more than 10 innings in one day. A lot of people have had a little problem understanding that because it doesn't, the wording isn't the way the interpretation came out in the papers the other day. 1 1 pitch. Vaughn backs out of there. It's good intent, though. The intent is to keep the coaches from throwing the pitchers too much and hurting their arms at this age. Off the fists and fouled out of play. What I was saying before, you can see how aggressive he was in that swing. He's got a right-handed pitcher in there now, and he's anxious to get up there and hit. The lefty, they're a little tentative up there. He had two walks, but you see that was his best swing of the night. He was real aggressive on that cut. Claude is just a sophomore. Well, you can see he's not afraid to swing the bat. Not a big guy, 5'9", about 155 pounds. But Bard expecting... Uh, some great th things out of this youngster in the next couple of years. Wow. Was after a breaking ball, a little bit high. Like. Loosey goosey, baby. Oh, 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 Count two and two. He'll probably try to take him up the ladder now, make him go after a high pitch again, see if he'll stay off it. That's one of the toughest things to teach high school hitters is stay off the high pitch. It looks so good coming in there, let her high, but then it goes up. It doesn't come down. And that's going to be Joe. Good play by the third baseman. He recovered real good. Oh. Nice job by Ken Lakoski. Oh, no. And on the other end, too, De Silvia. Oh, Claude Love retired 5-3 to three for and, the second out. Okay, and the slide's going to slow him down a little bit. Great play by the third baseman just to get to the ball, then get up that quick with a quick runner. Might have a chance if he ran through the bag. Slide hurt him on that. That's something you really see more at the high school level. I think as the kids get older, they, you can break them with that habit, that, you know, the guys who have a tendency to do it. So anxious to get there, and they, they want to slide. The only time you want to slide is if you know that the, you can see the throw is going to be away from the first baseman, and you can avoid a tag if he's coming off the bag. But it really slows you down the slide. The one ball pitch to Brad Sheets. He tries it down the line. Lakowski knocks it down. Good recovers. Third baseman with two good plays. Here. So three excellent defensive plays here in the bottom of the fifth inning. And the Wildcats go to the sixth. The only time you might want to slide is a good dusty field. <laughs> can't see the base. <laughs> that we don't have tonight. Two to one, Western. We'll be right back. Started the day hitting 191. It's jammed, taps it back up the middle. It'll be a tough play for Guillaume. He's not going to make it. <laughs> that ball rolled up his arm. He got all tied up. So De Silva gets on base to lead off the western half of the sixth inning. Another look at that last play. Inside out swing, inside pitch there. Once it got up his arm, he was tied up. And even if he got it, I'm not sure that no. he would have been able to make the play. So De Silva with the infield hit. And that's the sixth hit of the night for the Wildcats. We can look for a bunt here. I guess they want to get that insurance run. Frank Stokes, the batter. We can really, because he's had a real tough time hitting. He would like to get another run here. I wouldn't be surprised to see this uh, batter bunting for the whole three strikes. Stokes 0 for 1, struck out in the second, walked in the fourth. Once again, Stokes doesn't get a lot of at bats, usually plays the field, but has somebody DH for him, takes a call strike. Number 12. 
Frank, a senior. He's been hampered the last couple of years with some ankle problems, some chronic. See, he's wearing a device on his left, left ankle. Right? Bunts at it, rolls foul. Double had, him, had him bunting the whole way. And the count goes to two strikes. I'll make that, excuse me, that was strike three. As he bunts it foul, and there's one out. The number nine man in the order, Jim Iacovoni, the second baseman. He has walked and struck out tonight. Mianowski's curveball just outside. Up high, 2 0. Among the holiday tournaments going on, Plantation is going to host uh, their own four team tournament right here next Monday and Tuesday. Uh, Western will be back in along with Boyd Anderson and Shamanad Madonna. A couple of teams from the county going over to that big uh, Sarasota Invitational Ed. Yeah, uh, that's a Sarasota ranked number one in the state in 4A and I guess last year they were the uh, mythical uh, national high school champions. They're ranked number one in the nation right now. In fact, the high school rankings one? came out today and, and we were ranked 15th. All right, well, congratulations. 3-0, or 3-1, and it's fouled back. So a full count on Iacovoni. Clyde Metcalf, the coach at Sarasota, does a fantastic job. They have a tremendous program there. I know a uh, number 15 ranking and 50 cents still gets you a cup of coffee, right. but what does that do? It's got to really be a boost for the team, uh, for confidence, and as everybody was excited in for. school, the mm -hmm. principal and everyone was happy. We realize it's just a nice compliment. And there's no way to know who the top teams are in the country. It's such a vast country. But just try not to get carried away with it. <laughs> Bart Graff making a trip to the mound following the sixth walk by Bianowski. Doesn't look as if he's going to take him out, just the discussion between pitcher and uh, Paul Reardon. Actually, it's uh, not a discussion. It's Bart yes, telling him uh, exactly what needs to be done right again, here. Are all the loyal Colonel fans enjoying the game this evening? There we go. Those are the fans we know and love. Western now with runners at first and second and one out. What's that? They already have a two to one lead as we're here in the top of the sixth inning. Thank you very much. And the top of their order coming up. So Bart wants to make sure everybody understands what's going to happen. Take a look at the plantation defense. Chad Lakowski, who's two for three, a couple of singles and an RBI. Kid they want up there. Curveball in the dirt, Reardon Those blocks it, but the runner's going to move up. At least the runner down at second base. De Silva now at a third. Iacoponi holds it first. It's taking him out for a pinch runner now. And we'll see who they bring in. Chris Kristoff, younger brother to Bobby, who is now down at first base running for Iacovoni. So everybody waiting around is the younger Kristoff, uh, stretches it out, takes a little bit of uh, runs over down at first base, and it appears that he's ready. So Mianowski will go back to work with a one ball count on Lakoski. Runners at first and third and one away. 
<clears throat> first and third situation again, and you got a one-run ball game. They're ahead, so they can. They got nothing to lose on it. Although they want to get this kid to hit, the leadoff hitter's been the best contact hitter. Moved to third. And I'd really like Lakowski to put the ball in play because the man right behind him, Mike Hudson, has really had a tough night with Miedowski. He struck out three times. That's for sure. Good play by the catcher right there. Once again, the breaking ball in the dirt. Back with another curveball. It's three and up. So Miyanowski just one pitch away from loading him up. Comes back with the fastball. Gets it across. Okay, we might get something going here. First and third, 3-1 count, and good contact hitter. Mark Graff yelling to the infield, saying, look for the double play, get the double play. Right yep. back up the middle, there Donahue to Gio. Got it. And back to first base and Fisher. So nicely done nice by play. the Colonels, a 6-4-3 double play, getting Mianowski and the rest of the club out of a jam here in the top of the sixth inning. So for the Wildcats, no runs on a base hit, no errors, one man left, and we go to the bottom of the sixth. Two to one, Western. Well, I beat the drum and hold the phone. The sun came out today. We're born again. St. Thomas coach Ed Waters and got a good ball game going between the Colonels and the Western Wildcats. We got a look at Bobby Kristoff, who came in a relief of Joey Ponton last inning with the Colonels holding, or trailing, by the score of two to one, and they're gonna have their big guns coming up here, Ed, and uh, as you mentioned last inning, these guys may be better off with the big right-hander in there instead of going against the left-hander, Ponton. I know being a left-hander myself, I remember in high school dreading left-handed pitches being in there because you just didn't know, you didn't you see, him to see him that often. Your turn, Paul, come on, Paul! Paul Reardon is grounded out and struck out. And the big catcher will start things off. Started the day hitting 296. That's a good looking ball player. One of his big defensive plays of the year came in the win over Tara Villa. Spartans got the leadoff man on. Sent him. And Reardon came out, gunned him down. And besides uh, helping to stop an early threat. Big lift. This might be a mistake. Ooh. He's in there. Oh, my. Because the ball was there. Every morning, Wally Billy Goldman came just around before with the a sun. tag. Every morning, that is, since 1927, when he opened Bonfield Service Station. That would have really He's hurt the second 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 built his reputation by taking care of his customers. But along the way, he's taken care of himself. Wally buys U.S. savings bonds, the safe, reliable way to plan for retirement. A lot's changed over the years. Luckily, there's one thing he can count on. U.S. savings bonds. To find out more, call 1-800-US-BONDS. Nice throw. WCCB TV 19. Oh, he's in there. It was a, he was safe. I think he was in there. So a good call by Harry Arises. No. Base path umpire. And a leadoff double by Paul Reardon here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Now, the only thing that might do is take the bat out of the hands of the next hitter here, Fisher. If he, even though he's the go-ahead run, they got base open. This, this kid's a dangerous hitter. We've got a pinch runner for Reardon, and we'll try to pick him up. 
Haven't been able, didn't, wasn't able to see his number as he went out to the field. He might get an unintentional, intentional walk here. They, I don't think they want, they want to give him anything good to hit. In fact, if they get ahead in the count, they'll probably put him on first base. Fisher had a double in the deep center field his last time up, one for two. These days, a lot of drug deals take place in luck. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's going to give anything to head here. He might even come out of the base. Yeah, it's you. This is a kid you don't want to be. He's a real threat up there. Christoph looks in for the signal. 2-0. Oh. The count. Oh, he helped him out there. High outside pitch. Sean Fisher tried to rip it into the left field. Two balls, no strikes. Nobody out. Runner at second. Bottom of the sixth inning. Oh, the Western dugout. Thought they had a strike. It's now three and one. Well, he's sitting on the fastball right now. He's looking for one pitch. Sean Fisher, the leading batter on this plantation ball club. Oh, he's going to have to high it, it could be playable. Coming back towards the dugout. Auto shop embodiment. Back to take a look at the car that just got here. I saw one of them giving cards out in the, <laughs> in the stands last inning, so must be a good night. Count full now, three and two to Sean Fisher. <laughs> See if Kristoff goes with. Got him. That's the fastball. Outside part of the plate, Fisher goes for it. And it's the first strikeout for Bobby Kristoff. One more time. Got him on the outside corner, good location. Now Kenny Smith, Western coach, back out on the mound. And some words about how to speak the pitch to George Bianowski. Kenny knows exactly what he wants to do here, and he's emphasizing that to his pitcher. Again, Kenny's background as a pitcher here is to his advantage. Bobby Kristoff getting the big strikeout on Sean Fisher after the Lead off double by Paul Reardon. Mianoski, right-handed batter who has walked twice. He scored the lone plantation run back in the fourth inning. Ball, low and outside. <laughs> Up high, two and oh. <clears throat> On deck batter is Aaron Voracek. Is this another situation, Ed, where maybe you're extra careful with the kind of pitches you're going to give to Mianowski, knowing that uh, you've got a guy hitting under 200 coming up next, and you'd also have uh, you know, the force out at any base if you didn't walk him? That's always in your mind. You don't. hasn't look like there's going to be any home runs at least so far there hasn't been any real home run threats in the game and you think your pitch is on 
you want to set up the force if you think he's going to throw grounders. Two and one the count. Kristoff steps back. We need our uh, runner at second base to turn around so we can see his number. Break the ball outside. So it's now three and one. Takes a look down to Coach Bart Graff. You get a look at Bart down in the third base box. Once again, Kristoff steps back. You look at the standings, Ed, and you know, both of these teams kind of in the middle of the pack are really no chance to catch the district leaders, at least for the regular season. But uh, you know, the district tournament is what counts, and right. you want to start building that momentum as you head into the final weeks of play. Yeah, they want to kind of jockey for position, too, on the seating. So Mianowski draws the walk, gives the Colonels runners at first and second with one out. And the right fielder, Aaron Voracek. So far tonight, Aaron has grounded out. Reached on the fielder's choice. One of his problems earlier in the year is that he was crouching over. He's a pretty tall guy, 6'3", but he was crouching in his stance. And Bart Graff and the, his coaches finally got him to straighten up a bit and it seems to have helped him the last week or so. Sometimes when a big kid like that gets in a crouch, he's, when he strides into the ball, he's, he's getting too much movement of the head and, and your eyes and hands aren't coordinating where your bat's going. Sometimes you get a problem swinging where you think the ball is. One strike pitch. Chops right it up the middle, middle, off the glove of the pitcher. He's sending him. Oh, the center fielder bobbles. Center fielder, Ponton, bobbles the ball. Well, Runs score easily. Aaron Voracek bounce one back up the middle. Bobby Kristoff leaping tries to make the play and deflects it. He made a nice try at it. The ball was hit well. They were sending him all the way, so we don't know if we would have better if we would have had him or not. He didn't hesitate a minute, but it did let the runner get to third. Runner there was Russ Sibner, the senior, who scored the go or the tying run. Well, the Colonel's still not through here as Matt Malinsky, who drove in the first right. run, steps in. Malinsky's the one who hit the ball through on the 3-2 pitch. All they need is a high chopper like that right now, and it'd be hard to double him up and they'll get that run home. They're playing back for the double play, and they're playing it in. Come on, Matt. Yeah! Outside, a lot, of, a lot of good possibilities here. You got sixth inning, two-two game. You got a man on third with less than two out. You got a first and third situation. Wolinski yeah. sits back and takes the call strike. Two and one. Be a good pitch for a good time for a squeeze play. We're going to talk about it a little bit here. Bottleson, have a word with Kristoff. We'll see how much of a gambler Bart Graff is. Does he play it straight and let Malinsky? swing away with a chance to drive in another run. <clears throat> he's got the extra, he's the home team, so he, he can gamble a little bit more. 2-1 pitch, yeah! off the fist, Kristoff, good play off the mound. His only play is at first base, and he gets the second out. That was heads up, because that would have been tough getting a double play on that one, because it was kind of a change up the way the ball went back to him. It wasn't hit that hard. Number 12, Ty Dummeritz. One more time. 
And I don't even think he was thinking double play yet. I think he was more concerned with the runner down at third. Right. I think he did the right thing there. He did the right thing. Because that's the that's the go-ahead runner. Next inning is the seventh inning. If he had made his mind up beforehand that he was going for two and he had made the communication with his infielders and didn't even think about it, maybe he would have had it. But that was a tough decision. Todd Gumowitz right swings and has the bat come flying right out of his hands. Gumowitz struck out. Actually struck out twice. And bat went flying towards the backstop. So the Colonels have four checked out at second. Manoski at third. One run already in. They're all tied at two. The main thing they want to do now is no wild pitches or pass balls. And keep the ball in the infield here. Third ball gets away from him. Two and one. Kristoff has come back to even the count at two and two. Number nine man in the order, Jason Donahue on deck. I'm sure Kristoff would like to keep him right where he is and start him off in the seventh inning. Another timeout called by Bottleson. Bart Graff goes over to talk to his pitcher, George Mianowski. Potential go-ahead run for the Colonels. Bobby Kristoff, who already has a victory this week, trying to stop things here and perhaps pick up another one. Look at this.